Sometimes we see you. You are deciphering contrast in a magnificent way. We like to put it in this expression. You are using the fertile fields of contrast and you are mining them for nuggets of desire. And when the desire is born within you and you feel the clarity of that desire, we call it a rocket of desire because it is usually a rather brief experience. That rocket of desire bursts forth out of you, but it is fleeting. It is something that was born from the clarity of your moment. You know more clearly what you do want, more clearly than ever when you are in the moment of knowing what you don't want. In other words, that clarity comes forth powerfully within you. But also in that awareness of what you do not want is a vibration that hinders what you do want. And so in that birthing of desire, there is always a pure rocket for a moment and then a sort of muddy mixture of vibration. And the sooner you get out of the muddy mixture into the clarity of what you want, the sooner you align your vibration with your desire and then law of attraction, the manager of all things, puts you and your desire in the same place. It is a magical, wonderful unfolding. But if you give birth to a rocket of desire and then stand with the dominant thought relative to that subject being still upon not having that desire, then that dominant thought will hold you as long as that is the dominant thought apart from your own desire. Now when we talk about a dominant thought, we really want to visit this subject fully here today. Because many of you have been studying science of deliberate creation with us for a while. And you are understanding our new expression of art of allowing. In other words, you are beginning to get it that your work is to allow the well-being that is natural unto you. When we talk about dominant thought, we want you to consider that every subject that comes up, your body, your primary relationship or relationships, your relationship with dollars, your financial well-being, your physical health regarding body, your relationship with your government or with your community. Every primary subject that is within your view, you hold a dominant vibrational pattern of thought. And whatever that dominant vibrational pattern of thought is, is what's manifesting all over the place for you. So for example, let's say that you've been inspired by a new friend that you've met or by some introduction to something in your physical environment, to a keen awareness that you really, really, really want a stronger financial footing. You want more money. You want a better lifestyle. You want more luxury around you, or you want more time freedom that you associate with money. In other words, you want more money. It's clear to you. You want more money. You would tell anyone easily, I want more money. The question that we would put to you is, where is your dominant vibration relative to the subject of allowing money into your experience? In other words, when you think about money, does it feel more like, shortage or not enoughness. Here's a better way of putting it. When you think about money, does it feel more like insecurity or does it feel more like security? Does it feel more like a little fluttering, fearful feeling or does it feel more like exhilaration? Every one of you, with no exception, can answer that question easily. And as you answer the question, you know whether the dominant vibration within you is about your desire or is about whatever contrasting experience caused you to formulate that desire. In other words, you can tell. Let's take the subject of your primary relationship. Maybe it's a mate. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a child. When you think about that relationship, does the feeling that overwhelms you feel like fun or like work? Does the feeling that comes over you feel like exhilaration, anticipation, or does it feel like struggle? Does it feel like freedom or does it feel like bondage? When you think about your body and you think about the subject of physical weight, does it feel like 
fit? Or does it feel like fat? <laughs> How do you feel? In other words, you know. You know the way that it feels. So what we are saying to you is, it's possible. It's probable. Well, it's pretty sure thing. <laughs> that on some of these subjects, your dominant vibration is not in harmony with your own desire. And it has to be in order for your own desire to be. In other words, if you have things you want that you verbalize from time to time, and those things are slow in coming, it's because your dominant vibration does not match your desire. The way you make a dominant vibration, a dominant vibration is just through attention to it. It's through steady attention to it. That's how it became a dominant vibration to begin with. Only most of you, and here's the really good news, most of you established your dominant vibrations over time. They're easy to change with focus. Or you established your dominant vibration with some very impressive happening something happened that really got your attention and even though it didn't really get your attention for a long period of time while it had your attention it really had your attention so we want you to begin to understand that your dominant vibrations are easy to identify and they're easy to change and once you accept that then you can just make up your mind what you want relative to anything make it your dominant vibration and we'll show you how to do in many ways here today we'll show you how to do that and then you're often running toward more contrast that gives birth to more desires that probably won't match your dominant vibration in the beginning, but no big deal. You can, with very little effort, far less than you think right now, change your dominant vibration so that it matches your desire. And that is really what deliberate creating is. It's vibrating on purpose. First, you have to be aware of what your vibration is. That's where your emotions come in. And then you have to change the vibration so that it pleases you and that's where focus or concentration or maybe a little willpower come in it is not a difficult thing as Esther gets ready to come to allow Abraham to visit with you through her interpretation she always sits and quiets her mind so as Esther sat to meditate to quiet her mind with the intent of raising vibration a thought kept coming into her mind and she would breathe more try to relax more focus on the hum in the air conditioner more try to find a vibration within her own oming but the thought kept coming back as they were driving from San Diego to San Francisco they stopped and Jerry as he often does is checking the fluid levels and the pressure in the tires and he noticed that the monster bus needed a little bit of oil so he, he added it and then they got back on the highway and proceeded further and then stopped a little while later for a brief stop and as Jerry walked around the motor coach with the car in tow he noticed that there was oil all over everything. The whole back end of the motorhome was covered in oil and the tow car too and the hitch in between. And he knew right away what had happened. He had failed to put the oil cap back into the hole. His dominant vibration was evident. <laughs> Now, it had started out, as Jerry is checking the oil and recognizing that he is wanting to add some, it's an interesting thing because it is always an annoying experience for him because the hole where the oil goes is in a very awkward position. And it takes a contortionist to reach it at all. And it's in such a small space that no contraption that he's ever purchased, and he has purchased many, <laughs> work so he has figured out his own special unique way of doing it but in the process it is always a little bit of an ordeal 
Now, there's more to this story. You have to understand that another part of Jerry's dominant vibration is that he likes to be very clean. He has the reputation among those who know him of being the only person that they've ever known who can garden in white clothes and not get dirty. <laughs> and so now, as he is dealing with this engine and with this oil, he's been very particular about not wanting to get oil on anything. So you can imagine how he felt as he is observing oil on everything. So he comes into Esther and he says, I've left the oil cap off. And so they make some phone calls and they discover that the nearest oil field cap is over 200 miles away. And they're on their way to a very important appointment to see those like you. And so Jerry says, perhaps we can find something to plug this hole. And so Esther is looking all through the motorhome. She is taking the lids off of everything, the caps off of everything. They don't know how hot it will be. They don't know if it will melt. They don't know if it will stay in. They don't know what will happen. But Esther is bringing, gathering from everywhere, pieces of things that might work. And she brings to Jerry a basket of ideas. And this one is too big, and this one is too small, and this one will bounce out, and this one will not work, and this one is too long. And then Esther goes back in, and she discovers this little brass coupling that is used to hook two water hoses together, has a very good weight, and looks like it is about the right size. And she takes it to Jerry, and he agrees it is just exactly the right size. And the weight of it will be good, because maybe it will stay in the hole if the roads are not too bouncy and if we drive slowly enough. And so Esther gives it to Jerry and receives adequate praise from him. And he looks at it and he holds it over the hole. And yes, it looks just right. And he holds it down in. And they determine that if they put just a little bit of duct tape around it and maybe a cork to plug up that one piece, that it will be just exactly the right thing. And as Jerry is lifting it out of the hole, the brass coupling comes apart. And the smaller part of it fell into. <laughs> and Esther said to Jerry, your life as you have known it is now over. <laughs> because now the only thing to do is to get a tow truck. After all, there is now a brass fitting in the engine. They cannot turn it on. And then Esther says, let me get a mirror and let us see if we can see it. And I will bring a hanger and we will see if we can fish it out. And so she goes and gets a mirror and they get a ladder and they precariously position it. And they look in with a flashlight and they can see the little brass coupling down in the hole. It is bounced this way, which means the mirror is reflecting it back. And now it is a big decision. Who will go fishing for the coupling? <laughs> it's a very precarious thing because both of them know, as they repeat to one another over and over again, we have to get it the first time. <laughs> if we move it from its precarious place, sitting there on that ledge, it will fall into the great crevasse of who knows what. And so it is determined that Esther will be the one. Her fingers are smaller. She can reach further in. And so... She is reaching, 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 and feels it with her fingertips. And then delicately pinches the lip of it between two fingertips and retrieves it. Yay. <laughs> the relief is unbelievable. In fact, they now feel so good that it was worth feeling so bad. <laughs> The sun is shining again. They are feeling more vital and alive than they've ever felt. They are proud of their ingenuity. And now they wrap the duct tape around it so that it can't come apart and they put the cork in it. Esther opens three bottles of wine to find the right size. <laughs> And Jerry takes wire and ties it so that if it does shake out, it won't fall into the fan belts and so on. And as they are doing all of this, Esther said, it occurs to me that this is why they call it jerry-rigging. 